In the quiet suburb of Stafford County, a nearly four-decade-old mystery has finally been solved. On a chilly night in November 1986, 32-year-old Jacqueline Lard's life was mercilessly taken. As the decades went by, the case became cold, but the quest for the truth and justice remained unwavering. Long after, a discovery would not only shed light on Jacqueline's terrible death, but also reveal a shocking connection to another unsolved case. Who could have imagined that the secrets of the past would resurface to unravel not one, but two mysteries? What does this mean for the families who have waited so long for answers? Join us as we dive into a story of unexpected twists and the relentless pursuit of truth. Could you guess how these two cases were connected? 32-year-old Jacqueline worked as a real estate agent. Stafford County, Virginia is where she resided and was employed. She was a mother of two, a son who was seven years old and a daughter who was 13, and was renowned for her passion and commitment. Her job at Mount Vernon Realty required dedication, lengthy working hours, and persistent effort. These qualities characterized her both on a personal and professional level. In November 1986, everything seemed just like a typical day for her. Maintaining the challenging responsibilities of a mother plus a career, but a devastating incident was about to disrupt her normal life. In the early hours of November 14, 1986, Jacqueline Lard went about her routine business. She got ready for yet another workday at Garrisonville Road's Mount Vernon Realty. That day, like many others, Jacqueline had to work overtime till the evening. This wasn't unusual, and Jacqueline dutifully fulfilled her obligation, not realizing the tragic fate that lay ahead of her. Her kids at home were used to the schedule. They were aware that their mother frequently worked late, so they were certain that she would be back home as usual. As the sun began to settle over Stafford County, the Lard's home was enveloped in an unnerving silence. Jacqueline had not arrived home at her scheduled time. Hours passed, yet she was nowhere to be seen. The next morning, with Jacqueline still not back, worry mounted to desperation. Subsequently, employees from neighboring companies found indications of a violent struggle at the realty office and notified the police. The office's floors and walls were covered in bloodstains. Her business cards, some real estate documents, along with one of her black pumps, were discovered scattered across the blood-stained floor. The following day, an astonishing discovery was made in the nearby Prince William County. The darkest fears of Jacqueline's loved ones came true. Two young kids playing in a wooded area next to Railroad Avenue and Woodbridge came across Jacqueline's partially naked body under a pile of disposed carpet. Her bodily condition suggested that she had sustained blunt force trauma, a brutal conclusion to a life that was remembered by many who knew her as lively and compassionate towards her kids. For investigators, the initial discovery from the crime scene and Jacqueline's last known whereabouts painted a serious picture. They put together the series of events that preceded her disappearance. They noted that on the day of her disappearance, Jacqueline was last seen by her co-workers at about 9 o'clock in the evening. There was evidence of a struggle at the realty office, which raised the possibility that this might have been where the incident transpired. In the days and weeks that ensued, detectives kept questioning co-workers, relatives, and other witnesses. Their goal was to recreate the last few moments that Jacqueline spent on Earth. Jacqueline's husband was a DEA agent. When she passed away, he was in Costa Rica on a mission. Her phone conversations, bank transactions, and professional dealings were all scrutinized. They checked for any clue that could direct them towards the suspect. A month after Jacqueline's body was discovered, her champagne-colored Nissan Stanza was discovered parked in Fairfax County. This provided yet another perspective on the mystery. It implied that Jacqueline had been kidnapped and forcefully transported to a different location after leaving her office where the tragic incident took place. Her body was discovered next to the abandoned car, which suggested a deliberate and possibly rushed attempt to conceal the crime. 
Despite the detective's efforts, the investigation quickly became cold. Throughout the years, the case has been revisited by a number of investigators. They conducted fresh interviews with witnesses and used advanced forensic technology to re-examine the evidence. Though there was still no guarantee of a match, developments in DNA testing offered hope for a breakthrough. The public was also requested for assistance by the authorities. Periodically, they made details about the case public and urged anyone with information to come forward. Numerous tips were followed up on, however, none of them yielded a potential suspect. As the years stretched into decades, the case was passed down from one sheriff to the next. They were all dedicated to unraveling the mystery surrounding Jacqueline's tragic passing, but the diminishing evidence and disappearing trails made their work more difficult. Sheriff Decatur would not allow this case to remain idle, and Detective D.K. Wood explored a new technology, forensic investigative genetic genealogy to help identify the killer, claimed the sheriff. Decatur claimed that the dedicated Detective Wood was unwilling to give up, Decades after the incident, the investigation into Jacqueline's tragic demise made a significant breakthrough. Advances in forensic technology and a renewed commitment to cracking cold cases served as the driving forces behind this. In 2017, Stafford County officials made the decision to work with Parabon Nano Labs. Using this approach gave the case a fresh viewpoint. It produced a profile of a suspect and sparked a new investigation into a long-standing mystery. Even with this advancement, the profile did not match any criminal database records that were currently on file. This resulted in the identity of the suspect remaining a mystery. Detectives were relentless in their search, and they shifted their focus to genetic genealogy. Genealogists can identify distant relatives by comparing the DNA from the crime scene with the online databases. On December 14, 2023, they developed familial ties to narrow down the list of possible suspects. Detectives zeroed down on Elroy Harrison, a 65-year-old man who was able to avoid justice, given that he was not formally listed in the DNA databases for criminals. After identifying Harrison as likely to be a suspect, police obtained a court warrant to acquire a new DNA sample from him. In February 2024, when this sample was compared to the DNA evidence taken from the crime scene decades before, it revealed a definite match to Harrison. It didn't just end there, as the detectives came across another startling discovery. The DNA evidence additionally tied Harrison to the 1989 murder of Amy Baker. On the night of March 29, 1989, Amy, then 18, was left stranded on Interstate 95. On Backlick Road in Springfield, Fairfax County, Virginia, her blue Volkswagen Beetle had run out of gas. She was on her way back home from her aunt's place in Falls Church. Amy turned on her emergency lights and walked to the nearest Exxon station to ask for assistance. Sadly, while out on the stroll, she encountered a vicious attacker. Amy was brutally assaulted and strangled to death. Her body was dumped in the woods close by. The next morning, her car would be discovered on the side of the road and towed. After learning that her vehicle had been towed, her family members who had filed a missing persons report hurried to the location where the car had broken down. Two days after she went missing, her mother Sue Baker and her aunt discovered her body behind a covering of leaves. It was close to where her car had been abandoned. The forensic evidence gathered from Amy's scene initially led to a conclusion, much like in Jacqueline's case. Similarly, her case became cold too. In 2020, officers from the Fairfax County Police Department's cold case team worked with DNA Labs International by providing evidence from Amy's case for examination. Genetic genealogy made a connection and brought both the tragic incidents under one suspect. It offered critical information that had evaded investigators for decades. Following decades of unrelenting investigation and groundbreaking developments in DNA technology, a Stafford County jury charged Harrison on March 4, 2024. 
There were multiple charges brought against him. It included a first-degree charge, abduction with the intent to defile, and aggravated malicious wounding of Jacqueline Lard, as well as breaking and entering with the intent to commit a felony. On March 5th, he was arrested from his Stafford County residence. After that, he was held without bail in the Rappahannock Regional Jail. The Fairfax County Office of the Commonwealth Attorney is working with the Fairfax County Cold Case Unit. They intend to bring up additional charges pertaining to Amy Baker's slaying. How Mr. Harrison managed to stay out of law enforcement's radar for so long is still a mystery. According to a June 1st article from the Richmond Times-Dispatch, he was detained in 1983 for a bank robbery in Virginia prior to the murders. Court documents state that on June 30, 1986, Mr. Harrison was released from custody, and no further arrests turned up upon a search of public records after that. In an interview on Wednesday, Miss Baker's mother, Sue Baker, 74 years old then, described learning of the arrest as somewhat strange. She and her husband found it surprising that the investigators were able to connect the DNA profile of Mr. Harrison to the two cold cases after all these years. Sue Baker stated, Fairfax is taking care of this and they will, but right now we want Jacqueline Lard's case taken care of, so we know he is never coming out of jail. We never expected this. I never gave up. I told her that I would never give up. Jacqueline's family currently does not wish to talk to the media about it. According to the Stafford County Sheriff's Office, such efforts represent a big step in the direction of solving these decades-old cold cases, as they provide some closure to the families that are affected. While we wrap up this tale of long-delayed justice, it brings many questions to light. How did Elroy Harrison, a figure who seemingly vanished into the shadows of society, manage to elude capture for nearly four decades? Could it be seen as a failure of the authorities that he remained beyond the grasp of justice for all those years? And what might have been the trajectory of this case if forensic technology had not advanced to where it is today? Join the conversation in the comments below, and don't forget to share this video to keep the quest for justice alive. A dedicated mother of five, Linda Lunsford worked tirelessly to provide for her children. Yet her life took a mysterious turn in 1996. After finishing her evening shift at Walmart, she vanished without a trace, leaving her family and investigators searching for answers in the ensuing darkness. As the investigation commenced, the police focused on somebody who knew Linda and who was the last person to have seen her alive. But to solve this case, though, they required more than just a gut feeling. They required actual proof. Unfortunately, Linda's family would have to wait 25 years to get the evidence they needed to bring charges against the culprit. What secrets led to her sudden disappearance, and how did her life become shrouded in such mystery? On December 25, 1996, Linda Lunsford, a 38-year-old mother of five children, was on her evening shift. She used to work at Walmart in the Village Marketplace Shopping Center in Chesterfield County, Virginia. She was helping in making arrangements to ensure the store was ready for the upcoming post-Christmas clearance sales. At 8.30 a.m., both Linda and a fellow employee, John Howard, had wrapped up their shifts. Just a few blocks from the store, they were having breakfast at a fast-food restaurant. The two had been together in the past and had an on-again, off-again relationship. They had been dating for about six months before, until Linda called it quits on John. In the brief period that they had spent together, Linda had become close to John's kids. This implied that she wished to maintain their friendship. Furthermore, they worked together, and Linda did not want there to be any kind of awkwardness between them. After breakfast, she was meant to swing by her mother's place and pick up her three daughters, but Linda never showed up. As the hours passed, worry grew. What other place could she possibly be? Her mother wondered. Linda preferred to stick to a carefully planned schedule. 
She had to because she had to work three jobs to provide for her kids. If Linda was to be running late for anything, her entire day would be thrown off. Upon searching for Linda, family members came across an alarming discovery. Her 1994 Burgundy Nissan Sentra was parked right next to the Food Lion store in the village marketplace. It was locked, and Linda was nowhere to be seen. Her family were concerned, even though there were no indications of a struggle in the car. The same evening, Chesterfield police received a missing persons report for Linda. They put pressure on the authorities to act right away. The family emphasized that this was a very unusual behavior for the devoted mother. The detectives checked the CCTV recordings from Linda's workplace. They came to the conclusion that she had voluntarily departed. Their attention then shifted to John Howard. He was the last known person that day to have been with Linda. When he was brought in to be questioned, he acknowledged having breakfast with Linda that morning. On the contrary, John's children provided a different account of what transpired. Upon questioning, the kids revealed to the investigators that they had seen Linda at their house earlier that day. This isn't what they were told by John. When presented with the new information, John quickly changed his narrative. John went on to say that Linda had visited his home to discuss about their relationship. He wanted them to start dating again, but Linda didn't feel the same way. John adamantly maintained that Linda had left his house that morning alive and well. The detectives suspected that John wasn't being completely honest with them. Since there weren't any credible leads before them, they decided to focus on him. His shopping history from the days leading up to Linda's disappearance was looked at by the detectives. They found out that John had bought a duct tape, lighter fluid, and trash can. Although there might be a good reason for each of these items, given the situation, a few questions were raised. Believing that he was their prime suspect, Chesterfield police filed for a search warrant so they could look into his residence. When it was approved, they searched through every square inch of John's house. They searched for any indications of foul play. During this search, nothing new was discovered, other than the odd fact that John was unable to provide the investigators with an explanation regarding the whereabouts of the items he purchased. Even with the lack of evidence, the detectives searching for Linda were still convinced that John was connected to her disappearance. But in a court of law, intuition is meaningless. They needed evidence, and even after looking in every possible place, they were unable to find any that linked him or anyone else to the case. Months passed without any reported sightings of Linda, and the case gradually became cold. In early May 2021, following years of frustration and misplaced hope, the Chesterfield police received an update on the Linda Lunsford case. After all those years, they finally thought that they had sufficient evidence to connect John Howard, then 62 years old, to Linda's disappearance. On May 17th, he was taken into custody. In August 2022, the case went to trial after he entered a not guilty plea. During the trial, prosecutors showed a recording from an early interview with a Chesterfield County Police Department CCPD detective and Howard. In the interview, Howard claimed that his relationship with Linda was intense. He acknowledged seeing her the day after Christmas at the time and insisted that she left his house by herself and he never heard from her again. Back to the legal proceedings, the jury deliberated for a week before returning with a verdict. Though Linda Lunsford's body was never discovered, they declared John Howard guilty for taking her life. The particular evidence used by the police to secure the conviction is not revealed to the public yet. Matt Barlow was a co-worker of both Howard and Linda at Walmart while in between semesters as a college student. He hoped the conviction would provide closure for their loved ones. I'm a dad, so the emotions of a mom working to provide for her kids she disappears. What are their lives like? He said. I understand that must have been extremely upsetting and traumatic. The mere thought of what happened? Things run through your head. Barlow claimed that although he had never met Lunsford's children, she frequently talked about them. He remarked, You could tell she really loved her kids. I'm just truly sorry that that happened. Barlow described Lunsford as friendly and compassionate, 
whereas Howard as reserved and straightforward. I remember when we came back to work, and they said that Linda had disappeared or was missing, and that John was a potential person of interest, Barlow said. We were all shocked, even more so when we realized that one of our co-workers had gone missing. And to be honest, it was frightening. Even to this day, when I go into that store, there's not a time I don't think of her. When Barlow worked at Walmart, he claimed that there were circulating rumors about what had happened to Linda and whether Howard was responsible. Howard was being held at the Riverside Regional Jail while he awaited his sentencing. In November 2022, his lawyer filed a motion to strike and set aside the August verdict. He asserted that the evidence is not enough to suggest that Linda Lunsford has passed away and that the circumstantial evidence, too, is not enough to establish that Howard took her life. The judge heard the case and turned down the defense's move to strike. At that moment, that was the case's status. However, there was still a twist to come. On February 7, 2023, Howard passed away at VCU Medical Center whilst he awaited sentencing, and so the case against him ended with his demise. On February 2, according to court records, Howard's lawyer filed a motion to extend the defendant's sentencing, mentioning the defendant's medical conditions. Attorney Greg Sheldon claimed that Howard was getting cancer treatment during the case's proceedings. In response, Chesterfield Circuit Court scheduled a pre-sentence report and status hearing for February 21st. However, Howard passed away prior to that date. Lakeshia Johnson of the Chief Medical Examiner's Office states that the cause and manner of Howard's death are still under investigation. His attorney said that most recently he sustained a fall at Riverside Regional Jail and, based on his daughter's words, fractured his orbital bone along with multiple ribs and went through two brain bleeds leading to two surgeries. Linda's family was devastated by the news. Although they had no affection for Howard, they were aware that when he was gone, he took the information regarding the whereabouts of Linda's body with himself. Naturally, the first concern when there is no body is how to establish the cause of death. And in the event that you are unable to do so, how can you determine who the real perpetrator was? Ultimately, in this case, the court concluded, after numerous hearings and careful deliberation, that the jury's verdict should stand. This is nevertheless undoubtedly an odd case. There's no documentation of a motion that might have involved asking Howard questions in the hopes of locating Linda's body. The defendant's sentence could have included that. Linda's children never had the opportunity to truly mourn their mother and give her a proper burial. Rather, they must make do with the uncertainties regarding what transpired in her last moments and the current location of her remains. Perhaps someday someone will discover something and be able to bring their mother home. In March 1990, Norman Lawrence Rich was viciously slain in his house in Washington, D.C., marking an end to his peaceful life. It left the whole community in disbelief and a family dealing with an unfathomable tragedy. For years, detectives were baffled by the unexplained circumstances surrounding his death. Initial leads, such as a statement from his girlfriend, Sheila Brown, provided little to shed light on his untimely passing. Although the case remained cold for a long time, Norman's family never gave up seeking justice. At last, over three decades later, their efforts yielded a breakthrough. But it came as a great shock to everyone. It turned out that the offender was far closer to the family than everyone had thought. Who would have thought that the answer to this mystery was hiding among those closest to Norman? What leads a person to betray their own family in such a brutal way? Norman, better known by his nickname Simo, was born in Washington, D.C., with eight brothers and sisters in total, he was the eldest of them all. They grew up in a close-knit neighborhood under the care of a single mom, and were also affected by the socio-economic hardships of the time. In Washington, D.C., the 80s and 90s were notorious for an illegal substance outbreak. As a result, the crime rate spiked, with violent crimes reaching an all-time high. Despite these challenges, 34-year-old Norman was an example of perseverance and strength for his family. Sekithia Tyler, his sister, described him as someone who put a lot of effort into providing. 
Norman gradually settled as a stay-at-home father. He then devoted his entire life to his three kids and girlfriend, Sheila Brown. What began as an average day on March 28, 1990, quickly turned into a heartbreaking tragedy that would change the lives of Rich's family forever. Eventually, Sheila gave a detailed statement about what transpired that day. Sheila said that the morning started with a knock on the door. Around 8 o'clock, they seemed to have some unexpected visitors. As she responded, she saw two men waiting outside. She was familiar with one of the men who goes by the name Ducky, but she had never seen the other one before. Underneath his arm was something that looked like a brown paper bag. Sheila informed Norman about the visitors and then left the house to get her hair done and run some errands. When Sheila got home a few hours later, at around 1 p.m., she came across a startling sight. In their bedroom, Norman's lifeless body was lying with multiple gunshot wounds. At first, the investigation into the Norman Rich's demise saw many obstacles. Sheila Brown offered specifics and assisted in creating composite sketches of those two men from the day of the incident. But due to the lack of conclusive evidence, these leads were never materialized. In the midst of challenging community dynamics, investigators conducted numerous interviews and looked into a number of suspects. The challenges were only made worse by the public's mistrust towards the authorities during the illegal substance epidemic and the ensuingly elevated crime rate. The case struggled with few cooperating witnesses and no conclusive leads, even though a sizable cash reward of $25,000 was offered. Over time, several investigators took on the case. They all encountered the same challenges and struggled to get very far. Meanwhile, Norman's sister became a persistent advocate for her deceased brother. She kept detailed records and notes of the investigation. She kept on pushing the law enforcement to crack the case. January 2021 saw a new detective take over. He focused on revisiting previous evidence and reconnecting with Norman's family and the community. This new effort emphasized in a thorough investigation of his previous relationships and followed up on leads from the past. 31 years after the incident, forensic technology advancements and an updated review of the witness accounts led to a crucial but startling discovery. Revisiting the existing data raised questions, pointing to Sheila, Norman's girlfriend. It contradicted her earlier version of the occurrence. Following an in-depth investigation, 66-year-old Sheila Brown was taken into custody in March 2024. She was accused of obstructing justice and second-degree fatality. In D.C. Superior Court, she entered a not guilty plea. Brown was released from custody by Judge Robert Oaken, who pointed out that she had no criminal history. This permits her to go back home, waiting for the case's ongoing legal proceedings. She was mandated to maintain regular phone contact with the court's pretrial services office. No other information was provided regarding Brown's arrest, but the authorities announced that their investigation had determined the motive was of domestic reasons. For the Rich family, this not only reopened previous wounds, but also evoked feelings of dismay and comfort. Now they had to face the truth. Norman's killer had been living beside them all along. Brown, who resided in Annapolis, Maryland, was arrested bringing a conclusion to a three-decade-long investigation. Albeit belated, the revelations provide Norman's family with a shot at justice and closure. This case provides a depiction of the difficulties that victims' families experience, as well as the impact that crime has on communities. As the court proceedings against Brown progress, they offer the potential of ultimately providing a resolution for the untimely demise of Norman Rich's life. This highlights the value of persistence and optimism in the pursuit of the truth and justice in unsolved cases. The date of the hearing is scheduled for June 28, 2024. On March 14, 1984, a grim discovery at a Charlotte apartment complex revealed the tragedy of Sarah Mobley Hall and her 10-year-old son Derek, a child with special needs. 
their lifeless bodies were found under mysterious circumstances, marking a sorrowful chapter in the community's history. Who could commit such a crime against a defenseless mother and her disabled child? What might have been happening in their lives that could lead to this tragic end? Charlotte, North Carolina, is renowned for its big city atmosphere and welcoming residents. But despite of its cheerful and welcoming exterior, when it comes to crime rate, Charlotte stands at the top of the nation list. And one such heart-wrenching incident that has ever occurred in the history of Charlotte was the 1984 slaying of a mother and son. On May 1, 1956, Sarah Mobley Hall was born. Sarah's mother passed away while giving birth to Sarah's younger sister, Mary. Thus, Sarah and Mary were brought up by their grandma. Growing up, Sarah became a gregarious woman. She was popular with everyone and friendly by nature. To her sister Mary, she was like a guardian angel who always protected her, and therefore Mary regarded her as more of a mother than a sister. Sarah always wished what was the best for Mary and had a great deal of faith in her. On September 3, 1973, at the age of 17, she became a mother to a baby boy and named him Derek Dion Mobley. For the following few years, Sarah continued to struggle with the responsibilities of motherhood. But by 1984, she had figured it out when Derek had blossomed into a cheerful 10-year-old kid. Derek was a boy with special needs and had a very strong bond with Sarah. On Ventura Way in Hidden Valley, they resided in an apartment. Sarah's sister Mary also lived nearby and frequently stopped by to see Sarah and Derek, spend time with them. By this time, Sarah was 27 years old and making her living as a teacher's assistant at the St. Mark's School for the Handicapped, doing her best at helping kids like Derek. Things were going great for the small family. That is, until Wednesday, March 14, 1984, when Sarah's neighbors reported to the Charlotte-Mecklenburg Police Department that the door to Sarah's apartment had been left open for days and that a bad stench was coming from her apartment. Upon showing up at Sarah's apartment, the police discovered Sarah and Derek's lifeless bodies. Upon the initial inspection of the crime scene, it was discovered that Derek and Sarah had both suffered fatal strangulation. Sarah also took a serious beating. Mary was taken aback by this gruesome news. She had not just lost her one and only sibling, but her innocent nephew as well. Now, all she wished for was for the person responsible to be held accountable for what they did. A sample of unknown DNA was recovered from a pillow at the crime scene, but it led nowhere. No matches were found, and the investigation produced no results because there wasn't enough evidence or any witness to the crime. Mary provided the detectives with as much information about Sarah and Derek's lives as she could. However, Mary's hope of the murderer of her sister and nephew ever getting caught faded as the investigation went cold. During the 1990s, Sarah and Derek's case was revisited multiple times by detectives at the CMPD, including Police Chief Johnny Jennings and Mecklenburg Sheriff Gary McFadden. Even after the case had become cold, they kept looking into it. That included a follow-up investigation into the case by Jennings in 1998. With the latest developments in DNA technology, he figured that perhaps the pillowcase sample could help identify the perpetrator. Nevertheless, as DNA identification was still in its early stages, he was unable to locate a match for the person responsible. However, over the course of the following few decades, advancements in DNA technology allowed the investigators to pin down Sarah and Derek's perpetrator. As the almost four decades old unsolved case of Sarah and her 10 year old son Derek leads to an arrest thanks to new breakthroughs, the CMPD detained James Thomas Pratt, a 60 year old man, on Wednesday, February 1, 2023. Without any issue, he was taken into custody from a hotel in York County, South Carolina. The commander of the CMPD's Violent Crimes Division, Captain Joe McNeely, said that James's criminal record only consisted of a few petty misdemeanor charges. James was identified through the use of modern familial DNA technology by the Cold Case Unit of the Charlotte-Mecklenburg Police Department. 
The funding from the Bureau of Justice Administration facilitated the police department to be able to provide James's DNA to Forensic Innovative Labs, a company for genetic genealogy testing. At first, the perpetrator eluded the authorities, but they eventually tracked him down via a positive match with a relative of his. Then, with the FBI's assistance, authorities were able to obtain James's DNA and establish a direct match to the foreign DNA collected from Sarah's Hidden Valley neighborhood's apartment. McNelly, though, refused to elaborate on how James's DNA was acquired. The case involving Sarah and Derek was ultimately resolved after years of meticulous forensic testing and evidentiary analysis, but the investigators are still trying to figure out James's motivation for the slayings. Pratt is presently being held at the Mecklenburg County Jail after being extradited back to the county. At the time of the incident, James was almost 22 years old. Although James resided in Sarah's neighborhood, he was not considered a suspect during the initial investigation. It was believed that he and Sarah were acquainted. McNelly stated that Sarah's family had been waiting for 39 years to find out who was responsible for their beloved Sarah and Derek's ordeal. Her siblings were informed by the police of James's arrest. Jennings claimed that there was a driving force behind his resolve to find answers. He had a deep emotional connection with the deceased woman and her son, who had been slain in their apartment. In order to solve this case, he continued to work with CMPD, he said, even though he ought to have retired by now. He was pleased that he had been able to provide Sarah's family some closure. As for how this case has inspired detectives to use the same DNA comparison technique, to solve other cold cases. McNelly anticipated that technology will continue to do so as well. Sarah's sister Mary claimed to have been carrying a weight for many years, thinking that the entire tragedy could have been prevented if she was with Sarah and Derek that evening. She went on to say that the arrest had helped her and her family put this difficult chapter behind them and finally move on with their lives. Mary applauded all those who contributed to the case's resolution and expressed her wish that James would serve out the remainder of his days in prison. With the arrest of James Thomas Pratt, the long-awaited justice for Sarah and Derek seems within grasp, but questions remain. Like how was Sarah acquainted with James? What was the motive behind the crime? And how did the authorities obtain James's DNA? What are your thoughts on the secrecy surrounding this crucial evidence? Should that information be made public, or do they warrant privacy for the sake of investigation integrity? Share your opinions and insights in the comments below. In the quiet rural expanses of Blissfield Township, Michigan, a shocking discovery in 1997 turned a local farmer's routine day into a haunting mystery when a human body was unearthed in a cornfield. The body was unclothed, missing the head and both hands, and a search of the field turned up no evidence linking it to the disfigured remains. For more than two decades, the discovery remained under wraps. The small town was thrust into the midst of a chilling unsolved case. Who was John Doe, and what story led him to that secluded field? Who was the monster behind this? And why would someone go to such lengths as to dismember the body? Today we'll dive into a case that still perplexes the residents of Blissfield Township even after a quarter of a century, the case of the Lenawee County John Doe. In Michigan's Blissfield Township, there is a blend of city and country life. With 3,905 residents, it's a tight-knit traditional farming community surrounded by acres of cornfields. Nestled amidst larger communities, it provides its people with a haven from the hectic lifestyle of the 21st century. This is where the mystery surrounding the John Doe from the cornfield began. On the morning hours of November 19, 1997, a farmer from Lenawee County arrived to check his cornfield as he was getting ready to chop the kernels off for harvest. The evening before, there had been a little snowfall, but not enough to cause any harm to crops. As he approached the edge of the field, he spotted something sticking out from the ground, covered by a thin layer of snow. As he went closer to it, 
he came to realize that he was looking down at a dead body. But both the hands and the head were missing from the body. Shaken beyond belief by what he had witnessed, he called the law enforcement officials, who rushed to the farm. Upon arrival, forensic teams immediately established that the body was male and had been disposed of there some time ago. The body had already started to decompose, and due to the intervention of insects and animals, the process was further accelerated. Despite scouring the area for evidence, nothing turned up. For the investigators, it was becoming obvious that this was a brutal case of murder. Additionally, it became evident that the crime had taken place elsewhere and that the body had been discarded in the cornfield since there were no signs of blood around the body, which would have happened if the deceased's limbs had been amputated in the field. Moreover, passers-by had easy access to the crime site because Blissfield Township's Section 22 roadway was only 50 yards from it. To conduct further examinations, the body was brought to the coroner's office. Nowhere on the body were any distinctive marks like tattoos, birthmarks, or scars. Given the degree of decomposition, the coroner concluded that the killing happened within the last three months. Examining the wounds caused by the mutilation meticulously, he determined that the victim's body parts had been sawed off. The wrist and neck bones have visible striations surrounding them. The examiner thought it was obvious that the attempt was to make it more difficult for the detectives to identify the victim. Through tissue samples and estimates, the medical examiner was able to obtain some basic information. He estimates that the victim falls between the ages of 20 and 40, has light skin, and is of Hispanic ethnicity. The victim's height and weight were believed to be between 5 feet 8 and 5 feet 10 inches and 150 pounds, respectively. Authorities went in search of answers. It was nearly impossible to identify the victim in the absence of a head or the hands. They interviewed the locals and looked through databases of missing persons. One theory that did gain attention was that the victim was involved in a drug deal gone south. Some locals claimed that there had just been a drug deal close by in Toledo, Ohio. That lead was pursued by investigators, but it yielded no results. Early on in the 1997 investigation, a tip came from an anonymous source. Investigators were informed that the deceased person might have been a man going by the name Roberto. Roberto was described as a Hispanic man in his 20s to 50s, with dark hair and a mustache. The source claimed that Roberto was a native of Texas. Additionally, he was married and was a father. Roberto went missing while he was supposedly visiting Chicago. They were likewise informed that Roberto lived someplace around McAllen and Westlaco, Texas, where he farmed chickens. Investigators used this data to upload the information into the NAMUS, or National Missing and Unidentified Person Databases. A composite sketch was made and forwarded to local media sources, but disappointingly, this lead ended up being fruitless. Authorities were under increasing pressure to solve the case, but since they were not able to find the hands or the head, they were left chasing shadows. Over the years, they continued looking into the case in an effort to uncover any fresh lead, but nothing ever seemed to materialize. In the end, the remains were interred in a pauper's graveyard in Macon, Georgia in 1997 under the placeholder name, Lenawee County John Doe. A victim's DNA profile was created in September 1999 two years later, however, at the time it provided no leads for the authorities. Although it was also uploaded to the NAMIS system, no valid identification was obtained. No one came forward with any new information, so for a while the case became cold once more. 2016 saw the case reopen for investigation. Authorities were looking into cases involving drugs in the region and assumed there might be connections to the John Doe case. Still, nothing worked out at that point. Then the pandemic broke out and the John Doe case was momentarily placed on hold. However, the Lenawee County John Doe case returned to the public's attention in 2022 with the founding of a new cold case team. 
The team consisted of state police officers, along with criminal justice students and faculty members from Michigan State University. Following painstaking research and reconstruction of the incident, a breakthrough was finally made in the case. In 2023, 25 years after the murder, Michigan police revealed that two men from Ohio had been taken into custody in relation to the John Doe case from 1997. On January 17, 2023, a warrant for the arrest of brothers Richardo Sepulveda, 51 years old of Cincinnati, and Michael Sepulveda, 49 years old of Toledo, was issued. The two males were apprehended on the same day the arrest warrant was issued by U.S. Marshals who were aiding with the investigation. Attorney General Dana Nessel of Michigan commended the teams for their tenacity in pursuing leads in the case and securing the arrests. The Michigan State Police, in collaboration with other local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies and prosecutors, collected evidence and created a timeline of the incident. I am grateful for their persistence in pursuing this case. Nessel stated in a press release that all victims of crimes deserve justice, no matter how long it takes to get it. How the investigation had its sights on the two Sepulveda brothers has not yet been made public, but it is said that an alleged drug debt scenario may have played a role. Ricardo Sepulveda and his brother Michael were under police surveillance since the beginning of the investigation, according to Sergeant Larry Rothman, the head of the cold case unit. Due to their past ties with drugs and narcotics in the Toledo area, these men have been somewhat on our radar since the very start. According to Rothman, that's most likely how they're affiliated with our victim, via drug dealing. According to Rothman, one of the tips originated from a woman in the Upper Peninsula who recounted a homicide with similar pattern. Both brothers were extradited to Lenawee County, with Michael renouncing his right to extradition while Richardo had an appearance before the Michigan Attorney General. If found guilty, they could be sentenced to life in prison on multiple counts that include murder in the first degree and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. The maximum sentence for each of the remaining charges, assault with intent to maim, tampering with evidence, and conspiracy to commit tampering with evidence, is a decade in jail. Even though the two suspects are in detention, the investigation is still being conducted. Although the investigation is still preliminary, according to Rothman, the arrest may hold the key to the case. It's still early in the investigation, so there's not a whole lot I can say. But we feel these two guys knew the victim. They used to be acquaintances. While the identity of the John Doe is still unknown, detectives are searching for information using crime laboratories and genealogical databases. The detectives have entered the 1999 DNA profile into other genealogical websites in the hopes of receiving a positive response. Genetic genealogy testing was regarded by Rothman as an important advancement in solving cold cases. He described the opportunity of using technology and genealogy to solve cases that date back decades in a way that wasn't possible previously as somewhat of a breakthrough. According to Sergeant Rothman, there are still certain pieces of information that need to be put together, and additional charges in relation to the murder might be brought against others. We hope that more people will come forward. There's no doubt that other people from the time period know some things, he stated. Someone might be missing a father. Someone might be missing a husband. Someone is out there who may be from Texas, and they are missing a loved one and are unsure of where have they gone. Rothman stated, all they know is that they left in 1997 and never came back. Answers to long-lost mysteries are now being unearthed thanks to technological breakthroughs and the use of genetic genealogy in cases that would have otherwise been forgotten. We hope that by drawing attention to these instances and raising awareness among a larger audience, we could encourage more investigations. If you know someone who has been missing, please utilize the available platforms to notify your local authorities with any information that can assist in the investigation.
On May 14, 1971, six-year-old Lujbika Topic was playing outside her family's house on Driyar Road in Windsor, Canada, when she was approached by an unknown man, offering her money. Later on, she was viciously assaulted and killed. Her body was found in a gruesome state, shocking the entire town of Windsor. Who was this monster exactly that could take the life of a six-year-old so violently? Today's case takes place in Windsor, Canada, known as the country's automotive capital. Windsor is widely recognized for its association with the original Ford Motor Company. Even today, it is still a pioneer in the automotive industry. But what makes it more famous are its annual fireworks display and casino. In 1965, Luca and Paula Topic welcomed Lubica into the world. She was one of the Topic family's ten children. In 1966, Lubica's family left Yugoslavia and moved to Windsor, Ontario, Canada in the hopes of a fresh start. Regretfully, not much is known about Lubica or the other members of the Topic family prior to the horrific tragedy that occurred in 1971. On May 14, 1971, it was late in the afternoon, and Luca, Lubica's father, was working outdoors. The sun was about to set whilst the children were playing in a parking area next to the Topics residence at 1293 Drew Yard Road in Windsor. Afterward, in the evening, six-year-old Lubica ran back home breathless but excited from playing with her brothers and sisters. She asked her mom if she could go outside and get some candy, but she didn't specify where she was going to get it. Her mother consented, seeing nothing wrong and allowing the child to enjoy a treat. She warned her, though, about staying out for too long. What she did not know was that this would be the last time she would see or hear from her daughter. A little while later, Paula summoned her children inside. Upon the children's return, she found out that Lubica was not among them. She worriedly asked the other kids, Where's Lubica? Her eight-year-old son, Michael, started telling her a story that no mother would ever want to hear, and over time her concern grew into horror. Michael clarified that sometime between 8.30 and 9 p.m., as he, Lubica, and the rest of the kids were playing outside close to a cafe across the street, they came across a stranger guy. This guy handed Lubica money to buy candies and convinced her to go with him. Lubica, without realizing it, agreed and left with the man. The stranger then gave Michael a dime and told him to ride his bike the other way. Paula, realizing that her innocent child had been kidnapped, desperately began looking for her. Paula desperately went through the streets of Windsor hoping to find her little girl. To her dismay, however, Lubica and the man who kidnapped her disappeared leaving behind no trace. Just as the frantic mother was running around trying to find Lubica, a police car drove by. When they pulled over, she told the police that her young daughter was missing. Soon after, numerous volunteers from the public joined in on the search, and within minutes, several more policemen were brought in, making it one of the biggest police searches in the history of Windsor's town. After hours of finding no sign of the Lubica, authorities started to assume other possibilities. As they were occupied scouring through yards, streets, and back alleys, they were mindful that their chances were slim. Regretfully, the majority of abducted children were reportedly slain in a matter of hours after going missing. The only eyewitness to the incident, Michael, described the kidnapper as a thin-faced man with a lean build, blonde hair, and perhaps around six feet tall. Following that, police released a sketch based on his account. Michael estimated that the stranger was in his teenage years, or early twenties. Since the sketch was made public, sadly, no further leads became available. The following day, what the family had feared the most came true. On May 15th, at 1 a.m., a policeman combing through the yards in search of the girl stumbled upon an unsettling discovery. Lubica's mutilated body was dumped by the perpetrator next to a garage, just across the gate that leads into a back alley. She had blood all over her face and a fractured right leg. Two of her teeth, knocked out during the assault, were found in the dirt close to her body by the police. 
the six-year-old girl's tragedy was so gruesome and unsettling that it sparked an atmosphere of anxiety throughout Windsor and its surrounding areas. The police were keen to apprehend this heinous assailant as quickly as possible, so they launched an investigation immediately. But besides the sketch made based on Michael's account, they had no real leads. In the years that followed Lubica's passing, hundreds of people were interrogated by the investigators. They looked into the leads and tips they received from all around the U.S. and Canada. Sadly, none of them led anywhere. Soon after, the case went cold. Even after over four decades had passed, the investigators were determined to solve Lubica's case. They stored tons of tangible evidence, which included the little girl's teeth, samples of soil, and her little worn brown shoes. All of this was done in the hopes that it would eventually lead to something and provide some measure of comfort to the victim's family. Between 1970 and 2000, the investigation was reopened six times in the light of hundreds of tips from all over Canada and the United States. In 2004, the technology advanced and police were able to generate the perpetrator's DNA profile. They afterward uploaded the profile to the National DNA Database, or CODIS, but were unable to find a match. The DNA was compared to multiple suspects, including those who were added later on in the protracted investigation, as well as those who were initially suspected, but all of the attempts were futile. As technology progressed, DNA samples underwent repeated testing. In a lot of criminal investigations, some evidence may be kept confidential and not released to the public. This could be carried out for a number of reasons, such as maintaining the integrity of the investigation, preventing rumors from spreading, or protecting probable witnesses or victims. The decision to withhold evidence from the public is generally made by the police or prosecutors. Their decision is based on a thorough evaluation of various factors, such as the possible influence on the investigation and the public interest. A tooth found near Lubica's body by the police in 1971 was not made public until 2015. In 2015, investigators offered a ray of hope when they presented new DNA evidence from an adult male's front incisor tooth, which was discovered fractured at the gum line next to Lubica's body. Furthermore, Two of Lubica's teeth were also discovered alongside. Following DNA analysis, seven distinctive sources of DNA were identified as belonging to a single person. Lubica's mother, Paula Topic, was well aware that there was only a brief period of time to rekindle interest in her daughter's case and bring forth justice in light of this fresh information. It was 44 years after her six-year-old daughter, Lubica, was assaulted and killed and she desperately believed that the man's broken tooth might hold the key to unraveling the mystery and closing the cold case. At this point, after years of remaining silent, Paula made the decision to confront the media and share her emotions. She said she could only hear her kid calling her name as she went to sleep each night, and when she wakes up, she finds her daughter gone once more. She continued by saying, that she kept a picture of her in the dining room. She stated, Every time I walk by and I see her picture, I'm reminded of her, and I miss my little girl so much. She hoped that the authorities could finally bring her the peace she had been searching for for 44 years. October of 2015 saw Windsor Police Detective Scott Chapman start digging into this cold case. It was one of the worst crimes to have taken place in Windsor's history, according to him. He spoke of the brutal assault and violation the young child had gone through. A lot of force was used on her, which is hard to grasp, particularly because she was just six years old. Chapman was prepared to put aside everything in order to find the answers. Regretfully, despite interviewing several persons of interest, they were still unable to establish a solid connection to the perpetrator. There have been over 500 people of interest in this case throughout the years. Still, they couldn't trace or tie this tooth back to a suspect, and the case fell cold once more. 
The suspect's profile was created in 2015. Nevertheless, it would take an additional four years for the authorities to solve the enigma surrounding the perpetrator's identity. In 2018, as DNA technology advanced, investigators used GED Match and Family Tree DNA to upload Frank Hall's DNA into databases and continued their investigation. They eventually connected the dots with a possible relative of the assailant, and after that, with more digging, they were able to identify the person in question, the murderer. An unemployed laborer named Frank Arthur Hall was named as the murderer by the police. The individual was unfamiliar to Lubica's family, even though he resided in her neighborhood at the time of her slaying. Hall was just 22 years old when he persuaded the naive child with a promise of money to leave her home. Not long after the incident, on May 14, 1971, in the late afternoon, Hall moved from Windsor to Edmonton and stayed there. It isn't clear from police files if Hall's house was searched during the original investigation in 1971. But Hall was notorious in Windsor and among other law enforcement agencies, mostly for theft and other property crimes. Unfortunately, in this nearly half a century old case, justice would never prevail. In February 2019, Hall, then 70 years old, departed from life. Following the perpetrator's identification, Chapman hurried to Edmonton to bring news to Hall's family prior to it being released to the public. The news took the family by surprise. Chapman said that the authorities don't think he was responsible for any other killings in the Windsor area. Detective Chapman nonetheless believes that more information regarding other crimes might come in now, that Hall's name is in the public eye. The information was not made public by the police until 2023, which was four years after the person responsible was first identified in this case. They initially thought that it would infringe upon Hall's and his family's right to privacy. Certainly the community was horrified to discover that the murderer had been living among them the entire time and had gotten away with this heinous crime. The fact that Lubica's killer was her own neighbor the entire time is indeed very disturbing. It is awful when you consider that the girl's family went through 52 years of agony without finding out who abducted and took their precious daughter's life.